Thank you very much for joining us on the Photo Funky Show, episode 149. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about the core elements of storytelling photos. Hi, welcome to the show. My name is William Beam. Hi, my name is Lee Beam. And we're here to help you improve your photography with visual storytelling, which actually happens to be the topic of the podcast episode today. Oh, what do you know? I mean, who knew? <laughs> and just to let you know, this is going to be our last this is going to be our last episode of 2018. Usually we take the last couple of months, or a couple of months. <laughs> we usually like to take the last couple of weeks of December, just family time, you know, relaxing, getting together and kind of rewinding and refreshing. And we're going to do the same thing again this year. So that means that we're going to stop the podcast with this episode, but we'll be back on the first Wednesday of January. So don't worry, we're not going anywhere. We're just simply taking some time to relax. And in our house, we say Merry Christmas. So hopefully if you're celebrating Christmas, Merry Christmas to you. And if that's not your thing, don't worry. We still love you. Yes, <laughs> yes so, we do. So we appreciate everybody. And and really, we just want to take this time for our family just to be together, relax and, and enjoy. So that's that's the only reason that we're taking a little bit of a break right now. It's for us. Absolutely. All right. In this episode, I got three takeaways, things that I want you to be able to understand and know when we get done with this. And for the core elements of storytelling photos really are you want to capture the things no matter what your subject is. You want to be able to look at it, come wide, medium, some close up, some observational photos to enrich the story. And we're talking about like a group or collection of photographs here. Any one of them can tell a story, but together they can tell much more of the, the story of whatever your subject is. And this can work with travel. This can work with portraits. You can work with almost anything, but we're going to go over why you choose those wide, medium, close up and, and other types of photos that go in there. And we want you to be able to understand how to find the interesting or memorable aspects of your subject and encourage you to use sequences, motion or animation from shot to shot to kind of emphasize part of your story. So it's almost like having a little short story within your overall story. Yes. All right. So let's, let's go ahead and start off with establishing the scene. And by that, that's where we're talking about the wide shot. If you think about movies, usually when they come across someplace new that they want to introduce you to a scene, they don't give you a real tight shot of something. Think about like Seinfeld, you know, when they opened up a segment that, and they were going to be in the diner, there was always that wide shot of the diner before they would go inside and see them in, you know, in their booth. Yeah. But something wide would kind of just establish, here's where we are. Am I in Havana? Am I in New York? Am I in a kitchen? You know, whatever it is. It's just, an introduction to your scene. Let's think about like some of the athletic photography we've done. What I think some of the wide shots we do is like if you might show the gym, you might show the stadium or whatever it is that's really placing you in the environment of your story. That's true. And, you know, it might not just be in a very specific series of photos that you post at the same time. But, for example, people following me, when I first got into the kickboxing my photos were of the gym. It was like of the line of heavy bags. It was of the rack of weights or the slam balls and stuff, with some bags in the background, maybe a pair of boxing gloves. But I was showing a very, very broad view. Now that the people who follow me have an understanding of where I am and what I do, my shots are much closer. So now you might see the you know, I've got my, the boxing gloves that I'm using right now are ringside. And anyone who's into boxing is familiar with that name. So I might have a ringside, the same brand as the, the bags that are um, that, that are in the gym. So I may have just the cuff of one of my boxing gloves with some creatine or something or some amino acids that have got mixed up in a water bottle and the tip of my foot with some foot wraps on. That might just be what I post because I don't feel the need to tell the whole story. However, I would not have gone in there like that unless it were a teaser, which it never was for my purposes. And, and those tight shots almost don't make sense until people know where you are. Or they what have you're doing. to put it into context. And, and that's what your your wide shot does. So we can go back a couple of weeks when we were talking about, you know, the food prep and the food photography. Yeah, there was a set there for where you wanted to show things, but also... You were showing different stations in a, a wide shot of the kitchen, kind of you know, maybe even if you standing behind the counter, or if you were chopping something 
would have established, okay, we're going to be talking about food photography here. Here's the person who's going to be doing, here's some of the food we're doing. There's the yeah. chef's knife. And all those things are wide shots that establish your scene. The next thing we get into would be the medium shots where you're getting closer. So for example, you, you jumped ahead a little bit and you were talking about the detail shots, mm -hmm. which are, are, are very important parts of the story. But I would say the next thing that you would want to make sure that you capture on your list might be you in that gym. If you're going to be punching or kicking and just showing you in context with what you're doing there. For sure. And I do that. I mean, I, I've gone. Oh, I go you do through, that all the time. I go through, but I go through seasons. When I say I do that, I'm talking specifically about me doing something, some more action shots. And um, it is difficult. I know that people pose for workouts. My whole approach to photography, I think this is where it comes into being true to the way that you tell your story. I like to be real. I don't want to pose and fake things. So if I get a photo of me kicking a bag or hitting a bag, I want to, that's what I'm doing, not just posing like I'm about to. And I think you can kind of, if you know, oh, you definitely can tell you know your background, you can tell if somebody's faking it. I mean, for example, I'm a runner. Primarily, that is what I do. And I see, you know, I follow a lot of running accounts, a lot of runners, and I really like them. But there are a few who are very, very popular. But every last one of their photos, they've got this big cheesy grin on their face while they're running. I thought, you know what? I actually do smile while I'm running. I'm not smiling on every run because I can tell you now I hate speed work and it hurts. So when I'm doing that, there is no smile on my face. And, you know, I, I kind of I guess I've started to see a pattern of every single one has a big smile and I'll smile when I'm done because I feel good when I'm done because I did it, even if it sucked like while I was busy. I'm not always smiling when I'm doing what I'm doing because that is life. No matter what you do, whether you're taking photos, whether you're at work, whether you're working on a project or with your family, not every moment is a smiling moment no. or a or an, a, an aggressive moment or whatever the, the context is of what you do. For me, you just got to be real. And I like to show all the aspects of the story. You know, that kind of reminds me of some photos I took years ago in Havana at the boxing training camp. And I've got the, my wide shot that shows the whole boxing ring and environment. But then like in the medium shot, I've got a couple of the guys that are running stairs and it's bright sunlight. It's hot. You can see the sweat dripping off their bodies, but they're still doing it. And then I got a shot of them after where I get a little bit closer and they're just, they're recovering, you know, in the stands outside the boxing ring and the sweats on them and, you know, their heads are hanging a little bit low because they're whipped. And those are the stories, you know, those are the things that are part of the stories. Like they're, they're there for training but they've got all these stages they go to. And then, of course, you know, I got them with a fight. But there, we also talked about some of the some of the details, you know, an important part of it. And you mentioned, you know, the boxing gloves. Like you've got, was it ring? Minor rings. And I, it's rings. just what I like. It's like and liking a Nikon or a Canon. Not one is better, exactly. but some just work better for you. And, and the brand that I remember from years past was Everlast. It doesn't really matter what the brand is. You know, you recognize a boxing yeah. glove if you see it. And you also mentioned, you know, like, what, what's the footwear? I've got shots of these boxers just with their shoes. Yeah. Because they got, you know, that's kind of like tall. It's not necessarily tennis shoes, but, the, you know, the boxing shoes, they're laced up pretty high and they're yeah. trying to support their ankles. And, you know, the gloves, we get a close in shot of their face with a glove in there is a beautiful portrait. Yeah. And, you know, working on the heavy bag just, or the, or the coach, you know, with the whistle around his neck, all those are little elements. And. What you want to do is capture those things from wide, medium, close up. But we also talked about observational. And what I'm talking about there is kind of like things that help move the story along and fill in the blanks. Running up the stairs, that was observational. You know, it's like these guys are running up the stairs. They're still training. They're not necessarily in the ring doing the stuff there. Yeah. They're doing the things that help them prepare and get ready to be yeah. in there. It's like a runner doing drills or somebody doing strength training, you know, gymnasts doing strength training. I mean, these are all, they, they're, it's the behind the scenes preparation that is absolutely essential, but you don't see it like in the performance. Well, and the coach is a big part of that too. When we were there, you know, looking at the training, the coach is there, he's got the whistle around his neck and he's got a stopwatch in his hand. You don't see that coach really so much during the fight. I mean, it's the two boxers during the fight. The yeah. coach may be in the corner in the ring and you might, if you're looking, you might notice them there, but you're really concentrating on the fight. But the story of training is the coach drilling these people 
to get ready for that fight. Yes. And that is kind of what I meant by observational. So it's not necessarily things that you see in the main event, whatever your subject is going to be. What helps it get there? What's part of the story? The same thing when I was traveling and, and looking in a city. There are people who walk back and forth all the time. And you can look at people and tell, is this just part of their daily commute? Or are they new there and don't know exactly where they're going? Yeah. And, right. you know, it's, it's, you just kind of look for, if you take some time and stop, and, and I'm assuming this is with travel photos, if you take some time and stop and look and observe what's going on, you can kind of tell something about the people around there that they will reveal themselves just by you watching. That's true. And, you know, no matter where, I, I'm just thinking back to something that I like to do when I hit Instagram. I like to, I actually click on people's profile because it's one thing when you're looking at a particular story, but this is really what we're trying to say. And I, some people just lose it. They, they completely miss it because they're not dialed in this way. But I think it's always there and it's important that it's there. If you click on something like Instagram where you get a grid, so I click on William Beam's mm -hmm. name, I get the grid where it shows his photos. I just randomly, I start scrolling through and I look at the pattern. And, you know, with some people, you'll see a pattern where it's always a big smiley face or it's always a thumbs up. Or, that's fine to have some consistency. But you know what? Then I start to read on there to see, okay, maybe this is their message. These people are, are trying to encourage others and that works. But when people are sort of just trying to tell their own story, because that's really what I do. I'm, I'm telling my own your story. Your Instagram is a story of your training it and, really and is. coaching. Not all my photos are smiling. There are some photos. I broke my foot at the beginning of the summer, which was really hard. And I had to find ways to deal with this and work with this without giving up my goals. I just had to sort of change direction for a little while. But that, if you scroll through, you might not understand what happened. But you can see interruptions. For example, I'm also very, very dialed in with my nutrition. I, most of the time, I don't eat crap. Um, but That's my job. I, well, we work together as a team and we are very good at it. <laughs> but, you know, if you look at, even if you had to sort of selectively pick out my photos of food, this is healthy food. But you will also see that regularly interrupted with that healthy food, is a glass of wine or some beer or, you know, not really desserts so much. Cause, but you can see that I'm showing you that, look, I do things well most of the time. And I also realize that having balance is part of being real, but I show it. And I guess I like to show it because that puts me out there as this is what I do. I'm not trying to only show the best bits. I might make sure that my photos look good for them or look good enough. But I'm not trying to delude anybody as to who I really am. One of the things, since you talked about Instagram, a lot of people that have some really beautiful photography only put up the beautiful photography. And it's, it's fun to look at. But when I see somebody who adds a behind-the-scenes shot, that kind of is interesting to me as well, too. It's like, yeah. not only did you come up with a beautiful photo, but how did you get it? Yes. that I find that very interesting, and I find that as enticing as the beautiful photo itself. And this is because it's part of the preparation. And no matter what you do, your preparation is part of what you do. I mean, nobody does anything well without preparation. Even no matter how much talent you have, you have to prepare. And some people are more efficient and effective with their preparation strategy. But regardless, you have to prepare. And I think I'm not, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with not showing behind the scene shots. But like you say, when people show how to, it comes down to a how to and everybody, if they were actually paying attention to you and they really like what you do, you want them to be interested in how did I do this? OK, so I've, I've got an example and this is a silly one, but it's we've got an Instagram account called Bean Picks. And just, it's kind of like our family Instagram. It's not really meant to impress you with our photography. It's, it's just, for fun for it's, us. It's for fun. And we put some of our travel on there. When we were, had a summer vacation recently in Las Vegas, we took our daughter out there. And one of the things that she really wanted to do was go to this place in New York City called Black Tap. They make really big, funky uh, milkshakes. Yeah. And she didn't know that there was one in Las Vegas. So I surprised her. We had dinner one night in the Venetian. And then we walked down the hall and I pointed to her and looked ahead and said, do you see that sign? 
and and she was really happy, so happy enough that I ended up buying her two milkshakes on that trip, and then she bought the most expensive ones they had. And <laughs> both times. <laughs> but they're really beautiful milkshakes, and that's kind of like what they call Instagram-worthy food. Yes. So we got our shots there. But you know what? This is where one of the things I mentioned as a takeaway can come into place is it's not just that you got this beautiful milkshake, but if you walk around behind the bar where they're making these things and say, hey, do you mind if I take some photos of you while you're making the milkshake? Usually they'll say, yeah, go ahead, because you're not you're not in their way. You're not interrupting them. For you're, sure. You're separated. Then this is a place where you can get some sequences or motion or video or animation, whatever you want to do, and get the story of how that milkshake gets built. Yes. And you combine that with the final product or maybe with the smiling face of your child enjoying the milkshake. And that kind of adds something to the story. It's a very short story. You know, the sh- the story of this milkshake, you know, from creation to obliteration. <laughs> yes. And the enjoyment. I mean, I I like posting photos of the empty glass. I've got one yes. of, you know, I've, I've kind of got a series from also, I think it was our first, our first visit to Black, to Black Tap that trip. And these are among my favorite pictures where which is probably why i remember them i mean tove didn't get to finish her shake because like william said she ordered the most expensive which had a whole ton of sugar stuff on it but i got a picture of the shakes when they arrived at the table we all did Mm -hmm. and i made sure that i got a picture of william and tove each enjoying his or her own shake but i also got a picture of william's empty glass after and because Tove didn't finish hers, she got a plastic cup to take it with her. And I got a picture of her draining the remainder of her shake into the cup. And you know what? Those, those are um, those are really special photos to me because I remember that experience so clearly. And I think sometimes if you're paying attention to the experience and you take your photos of your experience, you really get something special in your story that you don't get if you're purely thinking about the photo. And it's not just one photo. There's a story. I mean, you can get a story with just a smiling face, you know, with this beautiful milkshake in front of you, but the story of how it was put together, how it arrives and yeah. you, you consume it. And then you've got the empty glass and you got a big smile on your face and you're happy and all that. It's a very short story, but you can do sequences of photos and that tells the story in a different format than just one shot would. We did the same thing. There's an also a place in Las Vegas. We've got one here in Orlando. It's called Sugar Factory. Yes. And Tove wanted a goblet. I mean, and th- this is an enormous, it's almost like a little fishbowl. I know. I was horrified to see the price of it and realize there was no alcohol in there for that price. Yeah, it, it is not an inexpensive <laughs> goblet. But it comes out, I mean, the thing is smoldering with, what, dry ice or something in there? Yeah, it was it was pretty special. But We've do you remember the look on photos. her face and, yes. and the photos that we got? And my favorite photo from that day is a photo of both you and Hovey smiling, enjoying the shake. That's just, because for us, this was a family vacation. And to be honest with you, it, it doesn't, to me, this is what speaks to who I am. It doesn't matter what it is. If my family members are there, they are always the most important elements of every experience even if it isn't documented so if they're present and and for a family thing think about this as something you're going to print and hang on the wall you don't just have the one shot up there like this or all our stuff in vegas you've got the story that you can put up there with maybe three or four photos together sure and that just creates a moment in your house that most people don't do that they don't but you know if you think about like you've got a wall and you want to put a you know, a strip of photos up in separate frames in a sequence. That's the kind of thing that works beautifully. It's the kind of, you know, step one, two, three, four. Even, even sports, let's say, you know, there's a batter up at a baseball game. You get your motor drive on your camera going and you capture the batter as he or she, depending, you know, I don't know, baseball or softball, whatever it's going to be, as they're in position, ready for the ball to come through. And then you just drive through shots as they come through the swing and if you're lucky enough and they hit the ball then you've got the capture of the ball flying off the distance that gives you a nice little sequence of motion and that tells something much stronger than just one shot if you might happen to time it just at the moment that the bat hits the ball yeah the sequence itself is is a story of just that moment these are things that we think that come up and help you combine the core elements of s- storytelling photos is not necessarily always one photo, but you can capture moments, but you can also capture sequences 
You can animate them together if you're going to present them online, maybe a GIF. There are so many ways to tell a story of your subject, but we think that if you're going to capture the place setting, you know, the wide shot, you're going to get into your medium shots to show what's really going on here. Your close-ups and details give you a view of something that maybe you just don't notice or in your, your wider medium shots, but yet some people who know say that tells the story. I know that if it's a the food photography, I know that knife. I know the cut that you're doing here. Yeah. If it's a place, you know, it's like, oh, I've been to House of Blues. I remember all those little bottle caps on the benches. Yeah. They're little things that kind of, you might gloss over them if you're just walking by. But if you stop and take time to notice it, same thing with food and your travel. If you stop at a nice Italian restaurant and you're sitting outside, you've got beautiful light, take a shot of your food. It's presented well. It looks the best it's ever going to be. And that's a detail that when you go back home and look at it and your friends look at it and say, oh yeah, I ate that. That's true. <laughs> I, I mean, I think no matter what your story is with photos, think about it like as a kid in the back seat of the car on a long road trip. Are we there yet? Dad, how long until we get there? It really is. You start from far away and you keep moving in closer. But what I wanted to say about this is that when you are somewhere and you might have some kind of background or you might have some idea of what to expect or completely know what to expect when you get in there. You don't necessarily have to take your far away or close up shots in the same order. Nobody knows what, oh, no. what order you took the shot. And this is something that gets stuck in people's head. They think, well, I got to start wide and that that works, but it's not always practical. Sometimes the detail shot you want as you're kind of going in to a restaurant, for example, um, maybe there's a crowd there or there's somebody in the way and the, the light's not right if you're outdoors. So go eat your dinner and come and, out and do it after. It doesn't necessarily have to be in that order. As long as you know what you need for your story, you can get the elements in any way you want. Exactly. But you keep these in mind. It's like, it's almost like a shot list. You prepare this before you go to a place or before you set up your portraits. It's like when you're going to do portraits, are you going to do like a full body of a headshot, a medium length, you know, three quarters? Are you going to do from different angles of the person, you sitting, standing, whatever it is, these are the things that you're doing to tell your story as well. Yeah. And your model is going to go through a number of different poses, but who is that model supposed to be for your story in these photographs? And you kind of want to direct them that way, but get your shots. And what we wanted to do with these, these ideas of the elements of storytelling is to give you something that you can keep in mind next time you travel, next time you go to an event next time you're setting up a scene in your house. These are the kind of things, take a number of different shots. And also to add to this, don't forget to shoot with the end in mind. So Lee mentioned on her food photography things, like some of these are going to be 16 by nine banners on her website. Some are gonna be square crops on Instagram. You may need to shoot the same thing with the same type of shot, well, you know, wide, medium or close up, but with room to crop in different types of output. And also, especially if you are putting something up where you need to add text, always make sure that you have some spare space somewhere yeah, that some, you can put text. Some, you know, there are a lot of times where text works over the subject, but that also depends very much on the colors that you're using and the mood you're trying to create and what you're trying to do. But I like to cover myself. I figure if I'm hitting the shutter, sometimes it means rearranging stuff if it's things that I can physically move around. But um, you just need to recompose, get some different angles. It doesn't hurt to throw away 20 to get the three you need for the different formats you want. Well, that's kind of going back to a scene where I was trying to capture a lady who was walking by a wall. The, the wall was yellow. She was wearing a blue coat. Beautiful colors that work together. Where am I going to compose her inside of my frame? I want her walking into the photo. <laughs> and I got some of my first shots with her just entering the frame. So that means I could put whatever text I wanted on the wall. Yeah. And then I wanted to get in a bit closer and tighter just to kind of show her up against the wall. Always think with the end in mind as you're composing these shots. And this is the end of the show for 2018. So we want to say thank you very much. We've really enjoyed having you here. We hope you've gotten something useful out of this. We would love to have your feedback and just let us know on the show notes. And we will see you again at the beginning of 2019. You can count on it.
Thank you so much for joining us on the Photo Flunky Show. This was episode 149. So you can find show notes available at williambeam.com slash episode 149. And we would love it if you would subscribe to us on iTunes. If you're on your device, you can go ahead and subscribe right now. Or you can go to williambeam.com slash iTunes. And if you're looking for subscription links for anything else, just go to photoflunky.com. You can find links to subscribe on Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and a little bit more. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful rest of 2018, and we'll see you soon.